Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Competitive Enterprise Institute for our event today with Professor Richard Epstein, Devin Watkins, and John Burlow. Your questions are essential to the conversation, and I encourage you to use the Q&A function found at the bottom of the screen or to send an email during the event to events at cei.org. Of course, we're recording the program and we'll feature it later today on CEI's YouTube channel. Now I'm especially excited for the policy forum because today we'll have a chance to dive deep on a timely issue for administrative law and the separation of powers. In less than a week, the Supreme Court will hear arguments in a case titled Collins v. Mnuchin. It came out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and addresses a familiar bundle of questions for the so-called independent agencies. Is the structure of the Federal Housing Finance Agency constitutional? If it is independent, what are the implications for the president's constitutional authority to remove the director? And if the structure is constitutionally unsound, what is to become of actions taken by the FHFA? The case offers a chance to get into part of the Bill of Rights that don't often get a lot of attention, the Third Amendment. We'll start today with three short statements, one each from our guests, and we'll proceed immediately to the conversation with you. At the top of the hour, when we wrap up, I'll remind you that we pay very close attention to feedback, and I'll ask you to, for your help by answering a four-question survey. So very briefly, I'll do all of our introductions at once, and we'll get going. First, we'll hear from New York University Professor of Law and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Richard Epstein. Professor Epstein possesses perhaps one of the most, if not the most, influential minds in American law. He's prolific, widely cited, and has shaped generations of students, practitioners, and jurists through a very active schedule of appearances and briefs. He recently collaborated with CEI on a brief on a major tort case in Oklahoma. Though it's not a subject for today's discussion, if you've never heard him hold forth on Roman law, you owe it to yourself to look it up. <laughs> He'll be followed by one of CEI's attorneys, Devin Watkins. Devin's handiwork shows up everywhere from the popular press like USA Today and the Wall Street Journal to CEI's regulatory filings and legal briefs. I'm eager to get his explanation of the constitutional questions at issue. And batting cleanup, we'll have senior, senior fellow, CEI senior fellow, John Burlow, who has deep experience in financial regulatory issues, the relevant agencies, including the FH, FHFA, and the effects each has on consumer welfare. Richard, thank you for joining us. Welcome. The floor is yours for some opening remarks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to take a slight diversion and go back to some Roman law principles to which Kent referred. Uh, the way in which the case is currently set up before the United States Supreme Court, it's an administrative law case trying to ask questions about the separation of power and the remedies that are given to individual people who suffer from various kinds of misfeasances uh, done by an improper agency. In order to understand what the case is about, however, I think it's very important to go back to the origins of the so-called net worth sweep, the Third Amendment, uh, which took place in August of 2012. Uh, what happened is in the 2008 bailout, it turned out that there was a claim that Fannie and Freddie were insolvent. And so what happened is several steps took place simultaneously. Uh, first, what happened is that the Federal Housing Finance Agency, run by a man named Edward DeMarco, took over the operations and control of both Fannie and Freddie. DeMarco himself was a former high-level official in the Department of Treasury. Uh, then what he did was to negotiate with the Treasury a preferred stock bailout arrangement, which called for a, the issuance of a senior preferred stock that carried with it a 10% dividend. And this arrangement was relatively stable until August of 2012, at which point there was announced a renegotiation that took place uh, between these two parties, that is between FHFA on the one hand and Treasury on the other. Uh, the shareholders and the traditional trustees of the Fannie and Freddie had nothing to do with the deal. And the so-called uh, net worth sweep resulted in a situation in which a quid pro quo was done as follows. Uh, the uh, companies were told that if they didn't have any money, they didn't have to pay any money, which was already the case. But if they did have money, then all the money would go over to the um, Treasury Department as a dividend, 
uh, and there would be no possibility of repaying the capital, some $187 billion that had been lent. And so once it turns out that everything is going over, uh, the shares themselves become worthless. Indeed, their only value was, do you still have a claim for breach of fiduciary duty or a taking against the government? The litigation began, and it was an astonishing pattern, which started with a decision by Royce Lambeth in September of uh, 2014, in which he granted the government a summary judgment, uh, which essentially said that there was no claim whatsoever that the shareholders had uh, when they were wiped out under these circumstances. Um, I can't go into all the many details of this particular case, but to set up the sense of what the enormity of the situation was, let me just mention three points so that the rest of the discussion could become relatively coherent. Uh, the first thing was that this agreement was extremely well, the original agreement, the 2008 agreement was well structured. What it did in effect is it says you pay a 10% dividend, uh, but if it turns out that you can pay that 10% dividend, what you're allowed to do is to defer the payment uh, so long as you now pay a slightly higher rate of interest at 12%. And so essentially what happens is if you do this kind of an arrangement, uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, can, if they don't have sufficient capital, defer the obligation. And when they defer the obligation, they don't have to borrow anything from Treasury, but it turns out that the junior shareholders and the common shareholders are going to get less money because the seniors get more. So they get the right incentives uh, that is the trustees, if they're doing this correctly, to figure out whether to pay or not to pay. And if this is correct, then there is no so-called death spiral, which means that in order to make sure that the treasury can be repaid, it will lend more money, repaid, more money lent, and all the rest of that going on and on. Uh, that just never could have happened given the way in which this particular agreement had worked. And so by the time you get to the Third Amendment, the companies are relatively solvent, they're paying things off, and you get the net worth sleep uh, sweep not in a time of poverty, uh, but at another time. The second argument, which is quite extraordinary, is whether or not it turned out that the junior share, preferred shareholders and the common shareholders could actually sue. And there is a provision in the basic statute uh, which says that all the rights of action uh, that go belong not to the trustees in the traditional sense, but go to the, the, the FHFA, uh, Mr. DeMarco, when he runs it. And this was clearly meant to say that he and only he could decide what suit should be pursued against third parties uh, to figure out how you could reclaim assets that were owing to the corporation and how to pay off obligations that it had. Uh, but the claim was made by the government with a lot of success uh, that this suit prevented the shareholders from suing the government for breach of the fiduciary duties uh, that the trustees owed to them. And this was a knockdown case because the way in which the negotiations took place it was not only the Treasury Department which said that it had a duty to preserve the FISC, which meant that the only kinds of loans that it could make would be those that had a reasonable probability of repayment, taking into account the interest rate and the underlying risk. But it was also that Mr. DeMarco had a fiduciary duty to the Treasury. So you had essentially a classic self-interest dealing between two parties, neither of whom thought it was its duty to look after the shareholders in question. Uh, that's a per se breach of any fiduciary duty and it means that you have to look at the transaction under the so-called entire value rule. And since it turns out that the shareholders are getting nothing and surrendering every, this is not a transaction that works for the mutual benefits of both sides. And so uh, you do is you find them being shut out from suits on procedural grounds, which of course is a very serious violation of not only substantive rights, but a procedural due process. And all of these wrongs would take place even if you had a perfectly constituted board uh, which you did not. And so that's the first two points uh, that you, you want to go there. Then the question is, how is it that you manage to justify an allocation in which all the money under the net worth sweep uh, goes to the treasury and none of it goes to the shareholders? Well, there is a provision in the statute which said that with respect to incidental expenses, they could be allocated as a trustee saw fit between the trusts on the one hand um, and the shareholders on the other. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out what the cost offer printing papers up uh, in a transaction or doing various kinds of administrative work, those costs could be allocated one way or another. Uh, what they did in Perry Capital was they announced that the incidental expense limitation was not sufficiently important so that you could take the entire proceeds of the sale and allocate it to whichever the two parties you wanted to do. And this of course was absurd because the way in which this thing was set up was that the, um, 
Our government was supposed to be conservative of the assets to manage them for the benefit of the beneficiaries until the company was capable of becoming solvent and being set free. Uh, so what do you have in this particular case? Long before you get to the administrative law question, is a breach of every known sense of fiduciary duty dating back to Roman times and consistently followed through in an effort to make sure that self-dealing by the government would wipe out these shareholders. And as the case then uh, failed in all of the cases that were brought with respect to these things, uh, the things started to turn over. And then what you have to do is to figure out how the case is going to work when you look at it through the lens of separation of powers. And at this particular point is where uh, Devin takes up the narrative of the story. So just real quickly, before I get Devin in here, uh, I do want to keep unpacking these uh, constitutional questions. That last point that you were making, um, is it fair to say that the, gov the government as conservator, the government as the fiduciary substituted its own interests instead of the shareholders, instead of the 100%. citizens? The shareholders so, got nothing and the government got everything. So the government became an... Uh, an active, interested player in preserving its own privileges and its own revenues. Uh, uh, yeah. Startling, striking, uncomfortable. Uh, Devin, uh, as I indicated in the introdu introduction, um, could you pick up with the structural questions about the agency, the implications for individuals like Collins, who brought the case, and other shareholders who have been harmed? I mean, there's real harms here when the government protects its, its interests instead of the, uh, those that it's supposed to be looking after. Well, oddly enough, the uh, question before the court really isn't about, uh, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Okay. Uh, the question before the court isn't really about uh, some of the statutory issues and some of the common law and fiduciary responsibility issues that uh, he was talking about, but is more somewhat foundational in how our government runs. Uh, the merits questions in many ways is about how we implement democracy. You know, we just went through an election. How do we make sure that selecting a new president actually impacts how our government runs? And just because we swap the person doesn't mean we've changed who has the power. And so to be able to ensure that the president has the power to impact these uh, people that are his supposed subordinates, ultimately, we need to have the president have the ability to fire them to be able to remove them so that someone else can fill that role. And so the first question is, can the president do that with this a person that's running the FHFA? Uh, if you read the statute, the answer is mostly no. Uh, the person can only be removed for cause, meaning if they don't do something to cause, uh, to create that cause that the president can then remove them for, the person can continue in office even if they have large policy differences with the president. This is a person who has a five-year term. For instance, if the term were to start shortly before uh, a Biden administration, the entire time that, the, uh, that uh, the president Biden was in office, the president would have no control potentially over who runs a very important part of the government. Uh, and so to be able to have elections that have consequences, uh, we need the president to be in charge of the executive branch. Obviously, they aren't in charge of the Congress, that, but there's another set of elections for that. Um, and they aren't in charge of the judiciary, but that's because of the independence that the Constitution guarantees to the judiciary. There's no independence like that for executive branch officials for which the president has the control. And the statute in this case says that the president, in effect, can, does not have full control, that they cannot remove the FHFA administrator. So if we look at the precedents recently, there's been several other cases where we've had this kind of protection for cause removal. And most recently uh, in uh, CELA law and other cases uh, where we have uh, protection of for cause removal and the Supreme Court has struck down and stopped that protection. Now that's the first question on the merits. Uh, is this person, can they be constitutionally protected in the way that the statute says? And I think the question there is fairly clearly no, that that's unconstitutional. 
even the government admits at this point that that is unconstitutional. Um, it was an overwhelming majority in the, uh, in the court below that that was unconstitutional. But the harder question is not really on the merits, but on the remedy. Once we found out, and once we've determined that the statute itself is unconstitutional, how are judges supposed to handle that? And this goes not to the powers of the executive branch or even necessarily Congress, but in my mind, the most important is the power of judges themselves. What are the limits of the judicial authority and uh, how should judges be acting in these kind of cases? Um, the lower court by a slim majority uh, decided to strike the provision that has that created the for cause provision that says this person cannot be removed for cause. In effect, what they did is granted prospective relief. They say, going forward, uh, this person can be removed without cause. Just anytime the president wants, if they need to remove this person, they can remove them. The problem with this is twofold. One, it doesn't actually provide any relief to the parties that are suing. And two, is this really within the power of the judges to do? So on the first question, um, the parties here don't care that much about, or at least as much about what the, what the agency has the power to do going forward. They care about what the agency did to harm them. In this case, the net profit sweep, where they kind of took all the money that it was supposed to be their money, and they just took it for the government. And if you make only prospect- I'm sorry for interjecting, but just to, I want to clarify for, for parts of our audience, they changed the deal. So the deal was 10%, or if you don't make the payment, it'll be 12% later. And they changed it to, uh, you get nothing, we get everything. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for the, the, the interruption there. So that change of the deal was the harm. It's what it, their money was taken from them. And in that way, they were harmed. And so if you just strike that for cause removal going forward, that uh, net profit suite that says we get everything um, is still allowed to continue. All the money that was taken before is still in the hands of the government. And the uh, actual shareholders here get nothing. They won, supposedly, because they were right uh, that the uh, agency was unconstitutionally structured, that Congress shouldn't have done this. But then the judges basically say, but you get nothing as a result. You get no benefits whatsoever for bringing this lawsuit. And um, you're still harmed by those unconstitutional actions. Um, I, I think that's improper, and it's not the way that it should be done. Uh, the second question is more fundamental in some ways, uh, but it relates to the first. And that is, what is the role of the judiciary? Um, in my mind, the judiciary, you go back to Article 3, is judges are there to answer and solve cases and controversies. You know, they got to to be able to get into court. You have to show that you've been harmed and that the court can redress that harm. But in this case, the court is saying, yeah, you were harmed, but we're not gonna redress that harm. And so- And, and again, that's the lower court. Yes, they the recognize lower court. the harm, but they, they offer no remedy. In fact, no remedy to the actual harm that these people suffered. Um, and so in my mind, really what you have to look for is what did the parties request? Uh, and then say, is that something we will grant or not? In this case, the lower party, the parties requested that the net profit sweep be invalidated um, and that they be kind of given back the money that th is really theirs. Um, rather than giving the parties what they asked for or saying that that is proper and legal or not legal uh, and we're not gonna grant it, the court offered an entirely different remedy. Uh, they declared what they thought the law was, which wasn't what the parties were asking for at all. And in that way, it didn't actually solve the harms that the parties had. Uh, so in my mind, what the court should be looking at is what the parties asked for. The parties asked that the net profit sweep be invalidated. If it's true that the net profit sweep was implemented unconstitutionally, then it should be invalidated. If it was constitutional, then it should be upheld. Um, but that's really should be the question. Uh, is it constitutional or not? 
And then the remedy should be, do we invalidate it or not? Um, rather than trying to go off on some other harm that they didn't ask for and they didn't care about. Well, I'm, I am getting a, uh, uh, on the alternate screen here, a flood of questions. Before we get to them, I wanna bring John in uh, to give us a little bit of context about uh, the scope of CEI's work, both in time and, and breadth. Um, many in our audience are going to know about our own case uh, here at CEI against CFPB on some of these structural separation of powers questions. Uh, the case uh, against the Dodd-Frank created public accounting board that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, John, can you tell us where on, a, on policy grounds, on the, the agencies that are involved here, uh, where does Collins v. Mnuchin fit into our work on consumer protection and on financial regulatory issues? Well, yes, we've been involved in uh, issues relating to the GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac since our founding by Fred Smith, who I believe may be listening now and watching. So hi, Fred, um, since our founding in 1984. And I'd say also in 1984, um, and since then, we've operated sort of under, as a free market group, under kind of two principles. One is that, um, well, of course, the principles that, the, you know, that the constitutional, you know, rights should be, you know, should be, should be guaranteed and should, you know, never be abrogated, um, even for so, quote unquote special situations. Also, we've argued for minimal regulations and, and uh, minimal barriers to entrepreneurs and different types of firms. At the same time, we've we've said that you know special privileges should not be firms should not have special privileges over their competitors now, and so this, um, for instance, we oppose the export import bank. We think it should be abolished, but we and we pointed out how some big companies like Boeing benefit from you know loans at. Uh, um, you know, that they would not have been able to obtain in a free market and that helps them undercut their competitors. However, I don't think we would ever, I know we would never advocate as a solution that the government, you know, confiscate 80% of or 79.9% of Boeing shares and then suspend dividends and then keep all of the profits and, uh, and put them in the government treasury, which is basically what happened here we've um uh our founder fred smith has you know questioned the notion of gses um you know in there which started out as a as you know as a as government organ organizations in the 30s and and then in 1968 lyndon b johnson partially privatized them uh you know and and where they were able to have private shareholders be like other corporations but still have the two billion um uh uh, each, uh, Freddie was created in 1970 as sort of a little brother to, uh, uh, to Fannie as, as with both having the quasi private status of having a 2 billion guarantee with the treasury department, which many took of that implicit guarantee it would never failed. But the situation when the government took them over because they were arguably insolvent and put them in the conservatorship in 2008, which they are still in, Everything is worsened, not just for the uh, for the uh, for the shareholders, but for the taxpayers as well. That basically the government and particularly the the, Ob the Obama administration, when they put in the third the third the third amendment, started treating fan you know would confiscate nearly all of their profits, would start treating it as a piggy bank uh, to pay to pay the deficit and to you know put you know spin the good news that the uh, the deficit is going down when really it was, you know, it was taxpayers, you know, the government, you know, owning this corporation that it would be responsible for bailing out paying itself. That left um, Fannie and Freddie vulnerable to any, you know, any economic cycle. And uh, Mark, when Mark Calabria, the current director came in there, he was able to work with the treasury to, uh, to at least partially suspend the third amendment, the network sweep. So they can build capital. And I think the plan he has now is, is and I don't know, you know what the future will hold. Some people in the audience may have a better idea. Well, than, we're than gonna we. get to that. I have some questions on that, and, but- um, Yes. Well, let, let, me, let me start 
uh, let's just dive into the questions for, for any and all of you, uh, but jo maybe John, especially this first one. Um, are financial markets special, right? I mean, you, you made this mention, this is a new deal era. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, mm -hmm. do we need government? Is it so important that we need government to, to run the industry or is it the case that uh, people have been transacting uh, financial mm -hmm. instruments for millennia and, and perhaps uh, it's time to start unwinding this very aggressively? I think I, I agree uh, with with Fred that there's nothing that this uh, the, the GSE has created an, o, an incentive for overinvestment in the housing market. And there's nothing particularly special about housing. And, you know, you shouldn't encourage home ownership before it was ready. You know, let the government decide whether real estate or or tech or um, uh, or medicine or or um, uh, or whatever, you know, should be should be invested in. But there are different ways you can uh, you can you can you can pri you can privatize things and get rid of government guarantees i would think from my colleague ian murray one of the best ways we should study is how um the uh british airways and other industries under margaret thatcher were privatized to where the shareholders um uh, got you know mm -hmm. were able were not you know were if if uh, were able to get in on you know you know keep were um the uh, well that you were able to have private shareholders in the in the in the comp in the comp in the company right. and that and but yet it, it competes with with competes with other things you could do this in a way where you remove the government guarantee where the law requires Fannie and Freddie to be taken out of conservatorship that's what Director Calabria says so that has to be done but then you know gradually remove the guarantees but you don't have to wipe out the shareholders in the process it's uh, it's unconstitutional. It's an abrogation of property of property rights, and it would, you know, it would unnecessarily scare people of invest of investing in the housing market. It would, it would, if you if you let if you let the Third Amendment of the net worth sweep stand. Um, Richard, I I'm going to get to some of these uh, legal questions, but do you want to? Were you trying to speak to the yes, uh, public I, I, goods provision question? Yes. Yeah. Look, I mean, one of the most dangerous words in the English language is this industry is special. Uh, you could say that about housing, you could say it about healthcare, you could say it about education, uh, you could say it about anything that you care to say. And the argument is that it's special, means that it has special forms of market failure for which government has to be in order to protect. Uh, but the greatest market failures or failures that we have in this financial situation is the status of an implicit guarantee. So these are GSCs, they're government-sponsored enterprises. Nobody quite knows what they are. Uh, there's no formal guarantee. Uh, but since there's an informal guarantee, everybody works to the shadow. And so when you start to make loans, you don't look at the validity of the collateral and the buyer. You don't look for diversification in markets. You know, the government is there to bail you out in the end. So you're willing to be much more reckless in the behavior that you have at the front end. And you don't want to do that. Then when you get the government involved, it turns out they don't play by the rules of the game. And so if what they did between Treasury and FHFA were done by two private parties with respect to trans, these transactions, everybody would be in jail um, because it is a blatant heist. And yet when the moment you put government people in there, all the special forms of immunities and preferences that are given, and those things then simply invite this kind of irresponsible behavior. And, and, and the striking thing is that you have to go over eight years since the uh, Third Amendment in the network speech was done, and you can't even get a judgment on the merits in any federal courts. And so what you do now is have this very odd, important collateral attack on administrative ground. And, and as Devin, I think, uh, realizes full well, uh, the government's position is gonna be one that's not gonna be trivial to respond to saying, look, okay, they should have been removable. You wouldn't have removed them. So what difference did it make? Therefore, remedy zero. Uh, whereas if you concentrated on the fiduciary duties and the evident breach of that, uh, what difference does a breach of fiduciary duty make? Well, the answer is all the difference in the world and the remedy becomes a uh, much easier. So one of the things that happens when you start having things special is you end up with legal quagmires, the likes of which that nobody could have predicted uh, when this thing began. And it's extremely difficult to figure out how you extricate because when you're building on a heap of rubble, it's very difficult to put a noble found building on top of a rotten foundation. And that's the problem that we face today. I, I think I might have a uh, Lastman's corollary to Epstein's rule. Uh, the most dangerous word in administrative law is quasi. 
Oh yes, well, that's, uh, I'm with that one. Yeah. That was the, that was the key word in um, Humphrey's executor. But yes, uh, yes. Uh, it, it Devin, was quasi everything. Devin, I want to ask you uh, a first question from uh, David, uh, and I do have a whole list of these here. But there's a pairing of questions that you can you can tackle as you see fit. Um, it, it's a little bit of a handoff there from from Richard. Um, but the first half of this is about: uh, Is it possible? Uh, not necessarily likely, but is it possible that we'll see uh, exit from conservatorship legally put in place before the inauguration next month? And then I think related to that is, could the Supreme Court meaningfully impose any sort of specific actions before next summer? And help us understand the timelines of the decisions and, and how those things would flow through the market. Okay, uh, well, first, the Supreme Court will be having oral arguments shortly. Uh, I think it's December 9th, if I remember right. Um, Correct. Then uh, after that, technically, the court can... We lost him. We lost him. Uh, well, technically, so... after that, just to continue the answer. Uh, hey, what they... oh, go ahead. Uh, there we go. Uh, it seems my uh, mic and uh, my camera's having problems, but... Um, so after the Supreme Court has oral arguments, technically the Supreme Court can issue their decision at any time. Um, and it could have substantial effect. That said, uh, it takes the Supreme Court some time to actually write their decision and to figure out what they're gonna say. Uh, so uh, I would not expect it any sooner than a month or two from the oral argument day. Um, but depending on how contentious the decision is, and this one could be quite contentious depending on exactly what's happening and what the split on the court is. Uh, it could go all the way to June before we find out what the court will be doing. Now, exactly how uh, the conservatorship, uh, there's a couple different things that are going on here. Uh, one, the government might settle with the plaintiffs before the court rules and moot the case. Um, depending on how oral argument goes, that could encourage one or both sides to settle faster. Um, the other possibility is that, uh, you know, with the now going administration, they want to make some you know, guarantees before uh, the new administration comes in. Uh, that could be a possibility as well. Uh, that would encourage uh, potentially a settlement or something else. The other possibility is even if they can't settle this case, um, the uh, current administration may decide to try to spin off these entities into the private sector without government involvement before the new administration comes in to kind of allow them to control what the um, restrictions of the new entities, new entities that are now separate from the government would be. So it's entirely possible and perhaps even likely that they will try to do so. Now, it's interesting to add, by the way, that in some of these cases, the settlements are not going to make the case disappear. Uh, so in a famous case involving Lucas, what happened is the government changed the statute so as to moot the particular claim and the Supreme Court said, no, we're gonna go decide this thing because there's an important question of principle here. It's been fully briefed and argued and we have to solve this. And certainly the extension of Saylor to a different kind of agency is one of those things as is the second question. Um, my guess is if they did mute it, they would not moot the separation of powers question. They might moot the monetary question, uh, which in many ways I think is a more difficult question. Uh, just as, a, as an odds make, I would say that the chances of uh, this structure being held constitutional after Saylor and all of the stuff going on is uh, in the neighborhood of 10%. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that they're going to win. Uh, the question about the remedy, I think, is wide open. Wide open on the remedy. Yeah, uh, I agree with that as well. We have, a, we have a procedural question uh, in, in the weeds of the case uh, about uh, documents that were sealed, about approximately 11,000 documents were sealed in the case. Are we likely to ever see uh, those come to the light of day? Depends on whether there's a case to need them subsequent down the road. So the first question you want to ask is, what's this decision going to be like? And one of the things that could come out is they could decide the first question, the structure is unconscionable and unconstitutional, and then remand for figuring out what to do with respect to the damage issue. And if that happens, uh, I think the documents may come out. The way it would happen is that the plaintiffs would allege that there's some bad faith on the part of the government, which I think you could prove. And so therefore, in order to establish the severity of what's going on, we have to have 
uh, evidence of the internal deliberations that took place uh, in the run-up to the uh, Third Amendment, that would be, say, starting in December of 2011, uh, all the way through its resolution. And indeed, since then, you know, lots of things have happened since then. Uh, it may be that you get a running diary of everything up to the present day. So most of these documents should never have been kept secret in the first place. Um, uh, that, that, it is, it is incredible that, that the Obama administration uh, claimed executive privilege, usually reserved for national security, for thousands of documents related to housing. And the Trump administration should work to, um, and whatever new administration should work to um, declassify the, I hate to, it's, I shouldn't even have to use the word declassify these, but you know, make them accessible to the public in the interest of open yeah, government. I, and I want to say something, quote, in defense of the Obama administration, not my customary take, uh, but the Republicans were every bit as much on the yeah. same side. Then, this is where the Democrats. Now, many of these are Paulson documents, right? Yes. I mean, look, I mean these, are, these are is a, this is a bipartisan problem. This uh, essentially, if you go through the history on this, the, Paulson started it. Uh, people like Hensling and so forth were very active in keeping it going. Uh, there was nobody inside government was on the other way. And that's one of the problems about getting this. It's what you see here is the government against the world. Uh, both parties in alliance, and the outsides essentially having to litigate somebody which claims extraordinary privileges for itself as part of its routine business, because the way in which every statute that we have is worded is the government gets all sorts of advantages as a defendant that no private defendant gets, and that goes to documents, it goes to deadlines, it goes to briefing schedules, it goes to presumption of legitimacy, and so forth. And so what you're seeing here is a rich harvest of the administrative state giving indulgence after indulgence on the theory that governments are never corrupt. And then it turns out you see a pattern of practice here, which when judged by ordinary standards of fiduciary duty is simply mind boggling, mind blowingly bad. You know, I would agree with Professor Epstein that there is, you know, it's, it's a bipartisan problem and both, you know, Republicans and Democratic administrations, the Bush and Obama administration are to blame. However, in keeping the documents secret, I should say, not even private, it had that has to do with the with the, the documents related to the Third Amendment under the Obama administration in 2012. So but they're still um, secret four years later, right? Nobody's released. They are. Them the they Trump are. The, 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 the Trump administration still has time to fix it and they should. Well, but remember when the key Perry Capital decision came down, that was in 2017 and Mnuchin was the defendant. It wasn't as though when the Trump administration came in, they said, we confess error and that there was serious breaches of fiduciary duties and we will make restitution. What they did is they fought the case on exactly the same grounds that the Obama administration fought. And so one of the things that you always have to worry about are strange bedfellows and alliances. And what the administrative state did in a particular case like this is is everybody saw $150 billion or more in cash going into the corpus of the treasury, which would reduce the deficit pressures bipartisan on both sides. And they were both willing to bite the particular bullet. And indeed, Perry Capital was itself a bipartisan decision, right? It was Judge Millett was a Democrat and Judge Ginsburg uh, on the other side of this. Royce Lambert, who gave the initial decision, dreadful decision in my view, he's also a Republican appointee. So uh, it's not just a question of uh, something unfolding here in front of us over the next few months of administrative law and then the nature of the rights of these shareholders who have been uh, harmed. Uh, we have a, a 12, 13 year case study packed together on public choice, government acting as an interested party as well as a participant uh, as a judge yeah. or a participant in its own case, in its own interests, yeah. uh, yeah. The deficit reduction, the the secrecy, uh, all these other interests that it has, it carries forward. It's also, I mean, I'll mention one other thing. If you look at the Federal Tort Claims Act, uh, uh, which is suits against the government and see the way in which it was drafted in 1946 and the way in which it was interpreted. It's not an accident, I think, that federal judges have read it extremely narrowly insofar as it gives rights to action against parties. And this started as early in the Dalhite case and in Ferris, these are cases from 1950 and 1952. Uh, and what they do is they read the exemptions broadly and the coverage narrowly. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, they're part of a federal system. Uh, so one of the reasons why you like privatization 
is that you can actually change the source of adjudication to neutral arbitrators appointed by the parties instead of having federal judges handling these kinds of problems. But I mean, it's really quite striking how bad these decisions have been. The Willett decision is, I think, a notable exception to that. Um, and you know, it does indicate that at least one Trump judge and probably many Trump judges um, are in fact intellectually more independent of the government that appointed them uh, than the judges of Obama or George Bush uh, or Clinton before them. And so here, here you're referencing F Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge or uh, uh, yeah, Don Judge Willett. Billet on the decision here about the separation of powers. No, he also did a very good job on reading the actual underlying agreement. I mean, for example, the point I made about incidental getting the power, I mean, he takes that thing and he beats it to death. I mean, just straight matters of statutory construction. Uh, can, can you illuminate for us, um, in practical terms, what would the justices have, to, the Supreme Court justices have to agree to? What would they have to condone? Uh, this is a question from Andy. In order for the Department of Treasury to win, what would the what is it that they would have to swallow? What would we be stuck with next well, year? I think they could certainly. I'll just briefly. Uh, everything you say about separation of powers, I think they will accept. This was the old PHH case. Kavanaugh decided it in the D.C. Circuit. He was overruled by a panel. Um, it wasn't though he was persuaded by it. He's on the Supreme Court now. Barrett, I think, as an administrative lawyer, is pretty much the same way as he is. So I don't expect any surprises. The hard question is gonna be on remedies. And one of the biggest weaknesses that you have in Supreme Court judges is they all come out of a very strong public law tradition. They don't come anymore out of commercial or business lawyers. Uh, but the basic arguments that we were talking about here, and you made it as a joke, but it's a true joke. What are the principles of fiduciary duty? Fiducia is a Roman Latin term indicating trust and how it's to be done. And the basic arguments there, you have duties of loyalties and duties of confidence, both of which, particularly the loyalty things were gone. And the question is whether or not the Supreme Court is going to take the fiduciary duty point particularly seriously in an effort to craft a remedy that is commensurate with the wrong in question. And given the fact that it comes up as an administrative law case rather than as a breach of fiduciary case, Devin will tell you just how tricky it is uh, in order to win that case. Devin, do you wanna to add to that? <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's quite a bit different. Uh, if this were a, a kind of private a, a disagreement between two private parties, you had a, uh, someone that was given trusteeship over these companies uh, and then did this uh, to basically take all the profits and give it to themselves. I mean, I got to imagine in a heartbeat, just about every judge in the United States would be saying, this is blatantly illegal, you know, and they would throw it out in a heartbeat. But, but they throw them in the jail. Look, one <laughs> of the things to note is I had a comrade in arms when we worked on these suits so five or six years ago, it was Ralph Nader. Um, Ralph has always been extremely sound, I think, on one issue. Uh, which is the breach of fiduciary duty issue, even if I disagree with him on antitrust and a whole variety of other kinds of questions. And he and I had exactly the same views on this particular case. Indeed, uh, we actually appeared on panels together, constantly working on it. But to understand how this goes, uh, it was only after 2017, 2018, uh, that the separation of powers issue became front and center. For the first four or five years of this litigation, it was all on breach of fiduciary duty. That's where the claim is strongest. And that's where the courts just turned us down cold. I still can't get over how bad these decisions turned out to be. Every last one of them. Uh, they sort of rival each other for sort of incompetence. And I, I, just as the story, I did many public presentations in that period. And people who knew the business would say, how could we lose? That was the question of how could we lose? So and I told them as follows, one sentence, said, if you have a perfect case against the government and you're litigating in federal court, you're lucky if you have a 50% chance of winning. Wait, what is the, um, well, that's striking. That, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, 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 that's breathtaking. Uh, <laughs> no, but, true. Uh, but, but looking, looking ahead, I mean, you've, uh, the three of you have referenced a, a series of things here. Um, you know, we start with the new deal uh, there was a mention of Morrison v. Olson, I think. We, mm -hmm. These separation cases, specifically, as you say just now, in the last two to three years, 
PHH, Celia Law. Yeah. Is, is this a rich vein for us to continue to mine going into the, um, the next several years? Are there, are there cases to be brought and percolated through the legal system uh, to continue unpacking and undoing the harms of the APA and, and the, yes, the new deal. Me, can I try an answer on that question? I think this particular line about the agency with or without removal is not going to be a particularly productive area uh, because the government can make adjustments on that with very little change in practices. The really important separation of powers cases are cases like oil states against Green and Lucia against the SEC. Mm -hmm. Because there what you do is you get yourself into an internal administrative procedure, which is an absolute due process nightmare. You get judges picking, uh, the heads of the panels being picked by judges to secure the outcome. Uh, you get uh, essentially internal deliberations within agencies that have a 99% conviction rate, often done by people who are not. If you go back and don't worry so much about the law, but look at the records that took place in both Lucha and in oil states, uh, these are genuine horror stories. And so the key thing to make understand is uh, to worry about the question of can you erode Article III court jurisdiction by creating these ersatz panels? And this is not an argument in favor of Article III. I'd be quite happy with Article I courts, which have been around for a very long time. What I am not happy with is a situation in which we allow administrative agencies like the SEC uh, to adjudicate their own cases inside their own form with only limited review. That's much more important issue structurally uh, than the PHH question. Do you agree so the, with that, Devin, the, or not? I mean, I'm just curious. So Devin, do you, do you agree that the, um, the removal power maybe has run its course, but these, question, these other questions about political accountability, about internal structure for uh, rigging the game, on behalf of the government agency by the government agency. Is that, is that where you want to see our program uh, pursuing litigation? So um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's run its course um, in that we still have a lot of independent agencies out there. And as long as we have agencies that can act in conflict with the president, uh, there will always, I think, be questions on removal and the proper control of the president over such actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, that said, uh, I actually completely agree with Professor Epstein concerning uh, the due process problems that exist currently in a lot of these agencies. Um, I, I actually, uh, looking at the, the prior case concerning uh, the removal of ALJs, I agree that um, the uh, power given on removal was actually, that the court actually did it correctly in analyzing it. But the problem was that the ALJs were part of the executive branch. And as part of the executive branch, they have to be under the control of the president. We need to switch from having ALJs as a part of the executive branch to having adjudicators that are part of the Article III branch. And it doesn't have to be an actual Article III judge. It can be like a magistrate selected by an Article III judge. But it has to really be a part of having that kind of separation of powers. Look, I, I disagree with one point on this. We have a long tradition of Article I courts, strange legislative courts, which go back to the 19th century, starting with customs courts. But the key feature is uh, that they differ from Article III courts only on one important matter, which is the length of term. And most people, myself included, believe that lifetime tenure is one of the many constitutional mistakes that are baked into our current system. Uh, and which is emulated nowhere else. So if you created even Article I courts with 15 or 16 year terms, like we have with bankruptcy and tax and so forth, and did it for patents or some other kind of technical area, uh, that would be just fine as well. But the key problem is you cannot allow, consistent with any procedural sense of due process, an agency to bring its own case before its own judges inside its own house. Yeah, so that's, that's the fundamental. And the appointments clause doesn't solve that, uh, because of the following thing. They did a bad set of appointments in Lucia. So what you do is you take a big stack of appointments, find the top of an agency is undisputed, and it just signs them all. Uh, it's the due process issue that is structural, and you can avoid the appointments issue by a stroke of the pen. You cannot avoid the due process in that way. Yeah. So, so John, did you want to add something quickly before I, I move us? I'm going to move us into the wrap-up phase. Uh, I'm mindful of the time and our, our audience's patience. Yes, um, as the only non-lawyer on the panel, um, uh, and, and the uh, and, um, can me if, uh, 
if if I uh, if 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 I'm wrong on this, but I believe um, the, uh, the one of the um, one of the important things that was established in Free Enterprise Fund versus PCAOB in mm. 2010, which CEI was of counsel, was mm. Chief Justice Rogers writing for the majority Robinson. that there is enhanced standing in uh, structural challenges that you don't have to go through the administrative courts necessarily if you're challenging the structure because that's something the administrative courts would not have expertise in. So as far as standing for plaintiffs to get a court review of an unconstitutional agency, you know, before it does the action, I think appointments, removal, other separation of powers cases are going to be very important. Well, I think in general, easing up standing seems to the way in which I think the Chief Justice was referring to, just to make it a little clearer to an audience, is you get two kinds of things. One is an agency acting ultra virus or is it with acting within the scope of its powers. And if you're challenging its authority to act, to have to go through the internal procedures and so forth seems to be a mistake. You'd like somebody to be able to challenge it on the simple grounds that it ought never to be there. Whereas if you're just talking about a decision on the particular merits that it's made, which don't go to the jurisdiction, then the exhaustion of remedies inside the agency would be more appropriate. And, and I think that's right. Uh, generally speaking, if it's a structural question, uh, that ultimately has a legal issue that the agency cannot resolve. Why do you want to go through the agency and slow everything down for two or three years? Concerning the Article One courts versus Article Three courts, obviously we can still have Article One courts, mm -hmm. in my opinion, but you, we can't confuse them with the Article Three courts. You know, we need either have uh, a, where the citizen kind of opts into the Article One court and chooses that rather than the Article Three court, or uh, there needs to be some kind of de novo review on appeal from the Article One court once we get into the Article yeah. Three. Well, de novo review on questions of law is certainly appropriate. And that, by the way, is also done even when you're talking about some of the procedures under the America Invents Act. Uh, but it's everything that goes before. Want of a jury trial, inadequate discovery, the ability of a chief judge to stack a panel in the way in which he or she wants the case to come out. All of those things are there. So uh, the key common feature between Article I and Article III courts is both of them have an independent judiciary. Uh, and that is, I think, more important than the duration of the particular judges. Indeed, ironically, there's very little sentiment in Washington today on the part of both parties to create new heads of Article III court jurisdiction. Much people, if they're saying, if you're doing specialized courts, uh, do it the way we've done it with respect to bankruptcy and tax. Nobody seems to think there are any detailed structural situations. As John says, there is a difference, I think. I can't even remember which way it goes, but in one place you pay the money into the government and then sue for a recovery in the tax court, or you have to bring an action trying to protest the payment in district court, or maybe it's the other way around. Those are relatively small procedural differences. Uh, the strike abuse that you see in some of these administrative law cases is great. And it's the same kind of abuse that you saw with the breach of fiduciary duty in these sorts of cases. It's just unimaginable how a person who believes in the rule of law can tolerate these irregularities and why judges will write opinions that simply turn somersaults to get the wrong results. Well, this, uh, this invites our very last question from the audience. And I'm gonna invite each of you, uh, kind of your one big takeaway or your, your closing thought for us. Uh, Gerald asks, with a big, unhappy, frowny face on his question. Where is the rule of law in our country? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe to put a little bit of spin on that, I would invite you to respond. Uh, is this putting us back on the right path, Collins v. Mnuchin, with respect to the administrative state? Uh, maybe we'll go John, uh, Richard, and then Devin, and then uh, a couple closing remarks here, and we'll cut everyone free for the afternoon. Well, yes, and let me say it's been an honor to, that's a great question, and it's been an honor to be here on, on this panel with my uh, my distinguished colleagues and with uh, Professor Epstein, who I've, I've just admired so long since I've been in uh, you know college and high school and first reading about liber libertarianism. So, um, but yeah, I think Collins versus Mnuchin is going to be an important case that it's, if, if the two, the two things need to be satisfied for the for the plaintiffs that they it needs to be ruled that yes the the, uh, the the structure is the structure is wrong the structure is unconstitutional but that you it's it's important to say that you need to get a remedy um, for uh, a constitutional defect 
just as if the fact that if you know if a, if a, if there were an unfair jury, this is basically an unfair regulator uh, improperly constituted a breach of representation government is like an unfair jury and things done under that agency like under a jury as Professor Epstein has said should be set should be set aside. Um, my takeaway is, is several. One is I think be very aware of the phrase that special circumstances require special procedures because everything then becomes special and nothing becomes normal. It's also, I think, how do you want to think about administrative agencies? I recently wrote a book, which I will now shamelessly plug, called The Dubious Morality of the Modern Administrative State. And the basic thesis of the book is as follows. Uh, when you're thinking about an administrative agency doing its kind of adjudicative work, think of it as though it were a trial court, a district court. And that means that it has a lot of discretion over questions of fact, subject to a clearly erroneous rule, ultimate questions of fact, it's subject to a higher standard of review, substantial evidence, and there's de novo legal review in the courts with everything that comes up there. And so what you try to do is to take the procedures that John referred to that work with respect to civil trials and transpose them into the administrative state. And every time we start to deviate from those procedures and from those safeguards, what we end up with is a degenerate system. And I think that the correct thing to say about this particular case, Collins, is it certainly gives an opportunity to go forward. It holds relatively little risk of going backward in any way. Uh, but in the end, the only way that you can have the rule of law, the only way, is you have to have sound procedures, but you must have a strong respect for property rights, fiduciary duties, and the like a procedural thin question of the rule of law will get perfectly consistent with the system of abject tyranny. And you have to be extremely worried about people who want to say we can have a value-free system of law. The thin conception of the rule of law is important, but it is not sufficient. Devin, what do you have? Well, to me, I'm hopeful that the court here will restore the rule of law. We will actually see this case as kind of a foundation that can be built on going forward to have uh, the rule of law actually be enforced. And, you know, if you look at some of the other cases like Lucia, uh, they said that the ALJ was unconstitutionally appointed, but they didn't, they didn't just stop there. They said, there's got to be a new hearing before a new ALJ with, that has properly been constitutionally appointed. They gave real relief. In Noel Canning, where they said that the uh, board members were unconstitutionally appointed. They didn't stop there. They said there, that the actual order by the NLRB because of these unconstitutional officers was invalid. They gave real relief to the parties. And that's what the court should be doing. It, it's not enough to say, you know, we're gonna provide prospective relief to some harm that they don't care about that much. We gotta provide real relief to the parties that were actually harmed and remedy their harms. Can I make one comment? Yes, sir. Um, the relief in Lucia was insufficient in my judgment. They ran the man back through another trial and eventually they exhausted him and he had to settle on very unsavorable terms for a case which was vanishingly weak when it was put forward by the government on the first case. So to take it in this case, what they should have done in that case is they should have just simply dismissed the charges uh, given the egregious procedure. And it's exactly the same question of small relief or large relief that's an issue in this particular case as well. It's a matter of degree. Very Not good. a matter of degree. It's this versus that. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, uh, a couple closing thoughts here. Uh, first of all, thank you to each of you as well as to our audience. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to, to not only look up, but go out and buy The Dubious Morality of the Administrative State, the book referenced by, by Richard just a few moments ago. Um, on the bookshelf behind me, there's a, a handful of his works and uh, I've been better for each of them. So uh, take a look at that. Also, uh, stay tuned to CEI's programs and activities. You're gonna see updates on this case as it moves its way through the process. And uh, if you wanna stay tuned, uh, Devin and John and others will certainly be writing about it and commenting on it. Uh, third, I mentioned at the top of the program, two things I wanna to draw to your attention. First, we will have a survey. It will automatically populate on your screen when we close out. Please fill it out. It takes less than 90 seconds. In addition, there was a glaring Easter egg placed in my introductory remarks for anyone paying attention to our program. I made a huge 
mistake and description of what's at issue here. Later today, I will put the uh, video of this program on Twitter, Kent at CEI, or at Kent at CEI is the Twitter handle. Whoever can get the most retweets for this program and call out the Easter egg, I'll send you a package of CEI swag, including a uh, capitalism sweatshirt and neck gaiters to keep you protected from whatever uh, somebody might be breathing on you in the, in the days ahead. We want you to help us promote this program. The issues about the rule of law, property rights, the administrative state, these are questions that more people need to know about and you can help us get the word out. So look for the, the tweet from me about the program you have a head start on everybody else in the universe because you listened to the last hour and hopefully you picked up on that Easter egg that I planted in the introductory remarks that was a glaring error in the description of what's at issue. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, we've now done two dozen of these programs in the past eight months. The next one scheduled is in about a week where we will feature Secretary of the Interior Dave Bernhardt. I look forward to seeing you then.